Hey everybody, uh, we got one more prison lecture here. I'm going to try to do a short one about people leaving prison. Uh, and as, our, uh, as we've been talking about, Americans lock up a higher percentage of our population uh, than any nation on earth. Uh, and 95% of those people uh, are released from prison at some point. The other 5% die in prison of various reasons, mostly um, things like suicide and chronic illness. Uh, and so when we look at the numbers, that comes out to be 650,000 people are released from correctional facilities back into the communities every year. And as I mentioned, part of my work here was motivated by a bumper sticker that said, today's prisoner is tomorrow's neighbor. Who do we want coming out of those prisons? How are we going to make sure that they don't reoffend, have a recidivism event? Uh, and reintegrate into the community. So it's important to look at those obstacles. And because of the mass incarceration boom of the 80s and the 90s that continued into the 2000s, there started to become more awareness of the people coming out of the other end, the 650,000 people being released back into communities every year. And so there's been a focus now on the concept of prison reentry, prison reentry. This is a hot area uh, where there's a lot of social work being employed, where there are some policies, including uh, some important legislation signed by President George W. Bush uh, called the Second Chance Act uh, to try to help those people not reoffend. Because we know, based on how you measure recidivism, roughly a third of those people will be back behind bars within three years of their release. So we really want to focus on this issue of reentry. And one of the reasons uh, I like to talk about it is it brings in this issue of trauma and how people coming out of prison with PTSD manage uh, their reentry back into mainstream reality, non-incarcerated reality. I don't know what is more real. Uh, but also, there are job opportunities here. I mean, we are funding now a lot of reentry programs, both in the nonprofit sector, uh, government agencies, uh, and there's more and more support for the notion of reentry and helping people reintegrate, especially since we've done such a good job of incarcerating such a high percentage of our population. We've got to provide a way out for them. Okay, so we're going to go through some of these issues. Uh, and one of the things that came up in our Zoom discussion is that there is a, a direct correlation between the number of visits people get in prison and their recidivism rates. The more visitation you get, uh, the less likely you are to reoffend. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for this, and, and, and some, of the, some of them we've discussed. But, you know, part of it is the importance of maintaining family bonds because those family connections, whether they are spouses or uh, parents or children, uh, help the person when they are released and providing them housing, which is often a very big challenge, but also uh, job opportunities. You know, you may have an uncle who can find you a job. It's interesting that visitation lowers recidivism on all measures, except for one visitation uh, actually increases recidivism, and that's visitation from ex-wives. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I can imagine. I can sort of imagine why if you were being, you know, visited by your ex-wife, why when you get out of prison, you're going to be more likely to reoffend. Nobody's really sort of explored that one. But generally, we see um, that. So the family bond uh, is going to reduce rec recidivism. Those links to the outside world. And so as we were talking about in Zoom, uh, you have less sort of toxic uh, masculinity and less kind of violent mindset. The prisonization, the term that we used uh, during the Zoom discussion, is going to be lessened by visitation. Uh, and we do know from the research that as people get closer to their release date, they tend to withdraw from prison culture. They tend to reduce their gang membership or have fewer disciplinary problems as they're getting closer. It's called anticipatory socialization. Just like when you start thinking about the first day of school and how what you're going to wear and who your friends are going to be, you start thinking about what your life is going to be like on the outside. Um, and so visitation uh, can help with that transition. Also, there are services within correctional facilities that help prepare people for release, to help get them ready for their next step on the outside, which is probably still in the system, right? You're going to be on parole, so you're in a supervisory setting. Very little places have true sentences where you do all of your time and then you walk out of the gate 
and you're no longer in the system. Um, so uh, there are a number of these things inside prison. And these, these are the things, by the way, that people often say, why do, why do inmates, you know, people who've committed crimes get these services? Well, the reason they get these services is we don't want them to reoffend. So shut up. We want to give them as many services as possible to help with their reentry. So, for example, some of these, just real briefly, are drug treatment programs. Uh, you know, people can be addicted to drugs in prison, and, and people who have addictive issues uh, can land right back in the world of drugs and alcohol as soon as they walk out of the gate. And so you want to help them with drug treatment programs. College courses to give them a leg up. You know, they spend a lot of time inside. Some of that has been wasted. So we want people to be able to get GEDs and maybe get some college courses, including sociology classes. Um, so when they do apply for a job, they've got something on their resume to show that they've used that time while they were inside. And maybe it was a college course that helped train them for, uh, you know, a career in IT or something like that. Uh, there are mentoring programs, programs like Los Hermanos, uh, where former inmates come back into the prison and talk to incarcerated people about what helped them uh, transition into a non-criminal lifestyle once they're released, uh, what some of the obstacles are. And some of these programs are highly effective, highly effective. To, I mean, just think about the ability to have former inmates who have been out in the world for a while come back and talk about here's the struggles here's how you deal with your parole officer sir here's how you get a good job uh here's how you stay away from um your bad influences uh, and those mentoring programs are really important job training is a big one i mean you know we exploit a lot of uh, labor on the inside and it's not necessarily to help them find jobs on the outside uh, so there can be job training programs uh, around uh, specific training, like carpentry, becoming an electrician, uh, becoming um, a landscaper, uh, but also working in, in tech. Um, cultural training is a big one. People are um, out of the loop, right? I've had uh, conversations with people coming out of prison that had no idea how to use a smartphone. Uh, how to use email uh, and use online web searches to look for jobs. They're just sort of out of the loop. And not only is it with regards to technologies, with regards to the, the social changes. You know, we are, as a culture, less sexist. So somebody who's practicing hypermasculinity in prison is super sexist, comes out and they need a job and they have to go to a female HR officer and, and, you know, this man might not have any idea how to talk to a woman who has a position of power. I had one um, former inmate, formerly incarcerated person, said he went for a job interview and referred to the woman that was interviewing him as honey. <laughs> he said, I'd, like to, I'd love this job, honey. And then he wondered why he didn't get the job. And so the cultural training isn't just about keeping up with the technology. It's also about keeping up with the cultural changes and the language that we use. This, In the work that I've been doing, um, this means how do we take people that have been involved in white supremacist prison gangs and prepare them for work in landscaping where a lot of their uh, bosses and colleagues are going to be Latino, right? You have to, you have to update your thinking if you want to be successful it's hard to become a nazi and then go out in the work world and wonder why you're not getting a job because you've got a big swastika tattoo on your chest uh, and then there's also parole orientation and this is fairly standard in prison you know you are being released from prison but you're not completely free you are still in the system and here are the expectations um what parole is going to be like and so here's what a successful completion of parole will entail so if you want to be completely out of the system, you still have some ways to go. So parole orientation is part of that. Okay. Uh, when people are in parole, there, you know, one of the ways we think about this is called supervised release. Supervise. <laughs> supervise. Supervised release. Sorry about that. Uh, and this is, you know, often in a halfway house. Um, sometimes people, you know, are expected to find uh, living arrangements. Often it's in a halfway house. There's one in Portland, uh, right on MLK Boulevard. Uh, and so there's often problems with halfway houses because um, nobody wants a halfway house in their neighborhood uh, or a group of, you know, formerly incarcerated people. So often we build these facilities out um, 
farther away from residential areas. So for example, there was a big one out by the Portland airport. And, um, but sometimes these halfway house uh, are kind of um, half free and half in prison. So, you know, there's all kinds of rules. You have to be in, in, inside by 8 p.m. Uh, and, but there are also sometimes problems because there are people who would, I'm trying to find safe language here, who might be in rival gangs in prison and might be really, really hyper-violent towards each other in prison, a blood and a crip or a Mexican mafia member and a member of the European kindred who are now in these small uh, residential facilities and are having to leave those prison beefs behind, right? Because if you violate your parole, including being violent to someone that you're housed with, you're back in the big house. Um, the main thing that the supervisor, supervised release housing settings try to do is continue drug treatment, I've sat in on drug treatment uh, therapy sessions. Everybody sits around a circle and talks about how their recovery is going uh, while they're on the outside, uh, and including you know people who are bitter rivals. Um, I was in one on MLK Boulevard, sitting between a member who's a European or European um, European kindred member and a, uh, a a black gangster disciple. <laughs> sitting right between them, but they were, you know, very honest in sharing about their struggles with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, maybe uh, more practical is that these uh, supervised settings really work on job placement. We're going to find you jobs. We're going to find employers that will hire people with felony convictions, which is so important, especially when the economy is tanking, to be able to find places where people can work. And so these um, settings are important, uh, but often you know, we have to remove them from places that might be close to where they work. And so, you know, you're getting on a bus. Oops, you're getting on a, you're on a bus looking for a job. Um, so when you are in supervised release, you are, that, that's another fancy term for being on parole. And we know that there are different parole styles. Parole officers can be very punitive. You screw up once, I'm going to send you back to prison. Uh, you, we can have parole officers that really focus on the practicality of parole. Here's how we get you the resources that you need. Here's how you get um, money for college. Here's how you get housing. Here's how you get a job. Um, there can be parole officers that focus on emotional support. They're kind of like therapists, which is, you know, sometimes when you think people be uh, as being parole officers, you think of them as cops, right? But they're basically the police people coming out of prison. But the most successful parole officers, based on the research that we have, are the ones that understand the emotional journey that these people are going through and can provide a listening board uh, to the to the struggles that uh, that formerly incarcerated people are going through. Um, there is a range of behaviors uh, that are required to be a parole officer. One of them is providing drug tests, having people um, provide urine for a fear urine analysis to make sure they're following the rules of their parole. I will not not tell you that I have not been asked by uh, formerly incarcerated people to pee in a cup for them so they can cheat on their uh, urinalysis. It's been asked of me more than once that I pee in a cup for someone who is struggling with heroin addiction, for example. Uh, but we also know that the most successful tactics, besides you know being sort of the emotional sounding board, are parole officers who, that do in-home visits, that, that have the um, time and the small caseload, and this is something that requires funding, have the time and the small caseload, not to just have someone come in and say, you know, tell me how your week's been. Okay, I'm going to move your file from this side of the desk to this side of the desk, which is the typical way parole officers deal with their cases. We can actually see their living environment, can see how they're uh, interacting with their family members. Are, are there drugs on the table when they come and visit them? Uh, is there a good relationship with their romantic partners and can do sort of in-home visits and then make suggestions about ways that they can best, um, best, make it through their parole. So again, there's a real need for people with a sort of social work mindset to become parole officers and probation officers. Um, we know that there are some obstacles in transition 
to transition. This is, this is something uh, where a lot of my work has focused on, especially with white supremacist gang members coming out of prison. Um, you have to have a little bit of social capital. Social capital is like money. Social capital are skills and connections. You have to know people. If you're socially isolated, especially if you haven't had any visits while you've been incarcerated, you're going to have very low so social capital. But if you've got a friend or a friend of a friend that can hook you up, if you know how to talk on a job interview, so some of you who took Social 204 remember the term impression management. If you know how to behave, what to wear when you go on a job interview, how to uh, use the internet, how to talk to people in a non-sexist, non-racist way, if you've got kind of that social capital. But in prison, a lot of that social capital is eroded. So you're, you're in trouble. Uh, and more likely to reoffend. There are some real practical obstacles. It's hard to get a job. You are allowed to be discriminated against if you've got a felony conviction. And there's a movement called Ban the Box, which refers to the box that says, have you had a felony conviction on a job application or an apartment, a rental form, uh, because you're allowed to be discriminated against. I mean, you're sort of at the bottom of the job hiring ladder. And again, when the economy is bad, you're really at the bottom. So finding a job, some of that... Uh, um, that, that also goes for finding a place to live. You know, if you're not in a group home or you're moving from a group home to an apartment setting and nobody wants to rent to you because you've come out of prison, you know, you have a, a reason or maybe a motivation to return to a life of crime or become homeless. Um, there are visible stigmas. When you're in prison, typically you're going to get all tatted up. I mean, this is mainly for male inmates, but also sometimes for female inmates as well. You've got a tattoo on your neck. You've got a spider web on your elbow. You've got a teardrop tattooed on your eye. You've got a swastika, you know, on your arm. Um, you've got some gang affiliation tattoo on you. And that's going to be a hard thing to uh, manage when you are trying to get a job. You can't, you know, cover up all the tattoos, especially if they're above the collar which is common in prisons because that, sh that shows you your dedication when you're getting your face tattooed. Um, there are beefs. You've got conflicts with other people in prison that carry outside of the prison. This can include some of the credit stuff that we talked about before, the prison credit uh, system. Uh, this can include, I had a guy who had to go visit his parole officer, had to take a bus from his residential facility to, to hit the parole office and rode the bus with a rival gang member. And they were sitting across on a TriMet bus, you know, once a week, staring at each other and thinking how they're going to like, how they're going to screw each other over. And so you have to manage those uh, practical obstacles when you think this guy is going to jump me uh, on my way back from my parole officer and, you know, how am I going to defend myself? So there are those issues. And then there are what we call philosophical issues. Uh, when you're coming from prison, prison has a very simplistic us versus them worldview. You're toxic masculinity through the roof you're ready to fight you can't sleep uh in prison you learn to sleep with one eye open because if you're sleeping in a bunk especially somebody might come in and get you there's a lot of people who have sort of ptsd coming out of prison that can't take showers because showers are a place of high vulnerability and so you're often attacked in the shower so you are kind of in afraid mental state uh, and adjusting to the outside world, I had one formerly incarcerated person say, you know, people wanted to help me. And I know in prison, when people want to help me, they want something for it. They want some credit. They want something back tenfold. And the fact that somebody just would want to help me to help me, they, they couldn't process that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the persistence of stereotypes. Uh, every bad stereotype you can imagine exists in prison. And so leaving that stereotypical world behind is often problematic. Um, we know that uh, different uh, ways of addressing this issue of reentry work. Uh, we know that there are some great programs out there. Real briefly, um, Oregon has one of the lowest recidivism rate, actually the lowest recidivism rate in the country of all 50 states. We only about 25 percent, as opposed to a third, uh, return to prison within three years. And we have some great programs. The Volunteers of America, if you're really interested, and I'll include a link on this video, Volunteers of America do some amazing work on the reentry issue, uh, helping people adjust to communities. Oregon has also uh, been utilizing what's called the Boston model. And the Boston model tries to spend a little bit more money hiring parole officers so we have uh, a lower caseload. 
the problem is when you have high caseloads for parole officers, everybody's just sort of a, a file, a manila folder. Uh, and so we've spent more money hiring parole officers, especially parole officers with a social work background. Uh, and the parole officers have to work with local law enforcement. So, for example, if somebody's being released from prison, not only is the parole officer informed, here's somebody that you've got you know, a little bit of uh, responsibility for, but the parole officer will communicate with local law enforcement that someone is coming back into the community to kind of help keep an eye on them. And they also will do more in-home visits, which is proven to be very effective. Uh, Boston dropped the crime rate dramatically uh, including going for over a year without a single juvenile homicide, partially because there was a coordination between parole officers, local police, so social service agencies, and just more parole officers doing in-home visits. And so um, that's one of the reasons Oregon has a really low uh, recidivism rate. And so there is a great opportunity to do some work there. Um, there's also, you know, a discussion happening now, especially in the wake of defund the police and Black Lives Matter. Should we use a different model? Uh, we spend an incredible amount uh, of our tax dollars on incarcerating people, roughly uh, for just a regular adult inmate, not even talking about elderly inmates or, or juveniles, about $35,000 a year per inmate, just warehousing them. Um, maybe we just hand them that $35,000. So we're now looking at, you know, what is the impact on that in terms of cost? What is the impact in terms of families, in terms of uh, people, especially black males being removed from communities? What is the impact on our economy and, and, and in terms of employment of removing all these people from the economy uh, and starting to look at uh, European models uh, and other models of punishment around the world, uh, including the notion of more home confinement instead of spent sending somebody to a very expensive prison uh let's send them home with a ankle bracelet and uh, make them go to work or go to school and be still be members of their family and be members of their community um and so uh there are these alternative models so some of the things we've seen are are, are more probation uh, being used instead of prison, the utilization of more halfway houses of people, especially juveniles, being housed in sort of group homes, uh, the use of drug courts to move people into treatment as opposed to incarceration, uh, finding ways of people paying back the community. Um, sometimes we like the idea of boot camps, we give them a little taste of prison and say, hey, if you really screw up, this is what's waiting for you. And as we've been discussing, prison can be pretty scary. Um, but also looking at community service and treatment, including for sex offenders, um, mental health courts to help people get the mental health that they need. We, we haven't even gotten into the discussion of now the high rate of the mentally ill that are being warehoused in prison. Uh, restorative justice, finding real justice with the victims and re well, something that's called re reintegrative shaming, helping people sort of to publicly make amends for the crimes that they've committed. Uh, and so these are all kind of alternatives to just warehousing people in prisons. So that's just a quick little picture of people coming out of the prison. The, the discussion question coming up in a second is going to be, why is it so hard uh, to stay out of prison once you've been released? Uh, what are some of the obstacles to reentry? All right, that's that lecture. Thanks.